Hello and good afternoon friends. Welcome to the CEC Edisett Live Lecture. Dear friends, in this lecture of ours today, we are going to talk about Plasmodium, the malarial parasite. What actually it is. We are going to discuss about it. But I would like to tell you that under this topic, we are going to cover various or wide areas such as its historical perspective, malaria endemicity in India, malarial parasite life cycle, symptoms and detection method, anti-malarial drugs and control and prevention measures. And for this, we have again with us in our studios, Dr. Amit Bhattacharya. Uh, if I would like to tell you about him, I have a huge list, huge long list uh, to tell you uh, what he has achieved till now. He has worked on the development of anti-malarials for almost eight years, as well as in many international journals, his researches have been published, such as American Journal of uh, Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, European Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, uh, Chemical uh, Biology and uh, Drug Design and many others. And if we talk about in context uh, to India, uh, his researches have been published uh, in 2009 and uh, the name of that research was Combo Therapy for Malaria as well as uh, Drug Combo for HIV Malaria which was published in February 2010. As well as he is Assistant Professor in Ramjas College in the Department of Zoology, uh, Delhi University. So first of all, I would like to welcome our guest Dr. Amit Bhattacharya. Hello sir, welcome to the Edisit lecture and uh, as you have uh, yourself worked on this uh, area, uh, I would like you to please start this lecture and make our students benefited from this particular lecture. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Malaria is a very common disease which have affected the human beings throughout the world. The parasite which causes the malaria is known as the plasmodium species. Let's start with the historical perspective where exactly the malarial cases started off. The malaria cases have been way back, reported way back 4,000 years ago and the name malaria came from the Italian word which means bad air which resembles mala area. So mala area means bad air as this name came up into the picture because the people who were staying near the marshy or the swampy areas, they were having this disease condition or the fever condition. Subsequently, the earliest reportings of this malaria can be found in the Chinese journal, which is Nai Zheng, which dates back 2700 BC, in which the malarial symptoms have been reported. So, the malaria is not a new disease, it has been reported way back. To, with the Indian's perspective, the malarial reportings have been noted or documented in Sanskrit medieval transcript which was written by Sushrata who was one of the Indian scholars. In his book Sushrata Samhita, he has mentioned the symptoms of malarial fever and he attributed that this has occurred due to certain insect bite. But at that point of time, it was not clear which particular insect caused this malarial fever. In the year 1880, Dr. Charles Laveran discovered the parasite of malaria in the blood. He took the samples of malarial patient and from these malarial patient samples, he prepared the microscopic slide. From these microscopic slide under the microscope, he found that there are certain stages which were pretty predominant. He drew the pictures of these microscopic slide images and these were the parasite images which was for the first time seen under the microscope. He published his this breakthrough article or the research in way back 1880 and if you can see the picture on the right hand side panel these are the malarial parasite parasites which he saw under the microscope in the malarial patients. So for his work in 1907 uh, Charles Leveron was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Subsequently, in the year 1897 and 98, Sir Ronald Ross discovered the role of Anopheles mosquito which acts as the vector for transfer of these diseases from one human being to the other human being. And to our pride, this research work was done in India. He worked actively in his Sikandrabad lab and his Calcutta lab. If we see the picture on the right hand side, you can see Sir Ronald Ross with his wife along with the lab assistants who assisted him in the working of and finding this malarial parasite 
vector. So if you can see, there are certain cages which are there. At that time of that time, he was working on the bird's malaria parasite. Subsequently, in 1897, he started working in Sikandrabad where he dissected out the stomach or the midgut of the mosquito which was fed with the uh, malarial patient's blood and he found that there are certain stages which were present attached to the stomach wall of these parasites. But he was very curious what exactly these stages were. So he, he strained these stages and found that these are the oocyte stages of the malarial parasite during the developmental process. So for the first time he discovered that the malarial parasite grow within the uh, stomach wall of the vector which is the Anopheles vector. And he published this breakthrough work in the year 1897 in British Jour Medicine Journal and he found, he published the paper along with the images of these particular oocyte. This, for this pioneer work, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in the year 1902. Sir Ronald Ross at that time was working with Indian Medical Services and was placed in India and working in the Sikandrabad. So most of his work, pioneer work was done in India. So to celebrate the success and 100th anniversary year of uh, discovery of Plasmodium oocyte in Mosquito, Indian government released a, rev uh, a stamp in the year 1997 to commemorate the 100th anniversary celebration of Sir Ronald Ross. Now, the malarial parasites, there are four major malarial parasites which are known to all of us. The first one is Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivax, then Plasmodium malaria and Plasmodium oval. So, in 1890, the Italian scientist Giovanni Grassi and Finetti for the first time introduced the name of Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium malaria, they which affected the human beings. In the year 1897, the American scientist William Welch reviewed and named the parasite which he observed under the microscope as Plasmodium falciparum. The fourth strain of the malaria was discovered in the year 1922 by John William Stephens and he named it as Plasmodium oval because the stages of Plasmodium oval looked in a shape of oval structure. So that's why the name came in as the Plasmodium oval. In the subsequent years, in the year 1965, there was the first documented infection of a infection which was caused by a malarial parasite which was named as Plasmodium nolesi. This Plasmodium nolesi was not new. It has been earlier reported in the year 1931 by Robert Knowles and his Indian counterpart Bridge Mohan Das Gupta. So they have named this <coughs> parasite Plasmodium nolesi. So this was the fifth strain of the malarial parasite which was discovered. <coughs> now the malaria uh, report which has been published recently in 2013 by World Health Organization says that about 97 countries throughout the world are suffering from the malaria transmission and about 3.4 billion people are at risk of malaria of which <coughs> an estimated of about 6,27,000 deaths are occurring of which 90% of the cases are being reported from sub-Saharan Africa. The most individuals who are susceptible to the malaria are the small children of the age of 5 and below 5. So most of the deaths are occurring in this category and it has been said that almost one child is dying every minute because of malaria which is really alarming. Because of the worldwide researches and the various control programs between 2000 and 2012, there have been a number of interventions of the control program which has saved about 3.3 million lives throughout the world. So the malaria disease is increasing day by day. So we have to stop uh, these malaria infection or the malaria parasites. If we see the global malaria epidemiology, we can see that the malaria is majorly constricted into few of the areas like in the Latin America, Africa, sub-African regions, India, some of the regions in the Southeast Asia. And if we see the red picture over here, the red mark shows the areas where the malaria occur throughout the year and in India we can see 
most of the places have been marked red because India is a malaria endemic country where the malaria cases are reported throughout the year. And even in some of the most of the areas of the Africa and South African regions, the malaria is quite prevalent. So if we see the picture of malaria endemicity in India, which has been published in 2010, we can see that whole of the India is suffering from malaria. The major areas which are suffering from malaria endemicity or high parasitemia are the areas which are there in Odisha, West Bengal, Jharkhand, Bihar, Rajasthan, Haryana, where the urban malaria have came up, state, uh, states of Northeast, Tripura, Meghalaya, Arunachal Pradesh. And if we see the uh, demographic picture of India, throughout the Indian plains, Indian subcontinents, the malaria is prevalent. It just depends upon how many cases are being reported from each of the areas. The most prevalent cases of malaria are being reported from the coastal areas and even many of the cases are now coming up from Andaman Nicobar where the fifth strain of malaria which was still now not known to the any of the Indian states have developed in the Andaman Nicobar Islands. So this cases are really increasing are becoming alarming as the fifth strain of the malaria is also coming to the picture. Now the malarial vectors are majorly distributed into 58 species which are found throughout the Indian subcontinent. Depending upon the different ecological settings throughout the India, the malarial vectors are being found. So the six major malarial vectors which are found throughout the subcontinent are Anopheles culsifacius, Anopheles fluvitis, Anopheles stephansi, Anopheles dirus, Anopheles minimus, Anopheles sandiacus. If we see the picture of India and how the major distribution of these malaria vectors which are the Anopheles mosquito is occurring, we can see that Anopheles culsifacius and Anopheles stephansi are prevalently and prominently found throughout the Indian subcontinent. This is because these two vectors are the vectors which are found in the plains or the rural or the urban areas of India. While if we see the Anopheles sandiacus, it is majorly found in the Andaman Nicobar Island and the coastal areas. While the Anopheles minimus and Anopheles fluvitis, these are majorly found in the dense forest area. So these six vectors, major malaria vectors are distributed throughout the Indian subcontinents and they are the one which are responsible for the transfer or the transmission of the malaria parasite from one region to the other region. Now, if we go into how we can distinguish between a Anopheles mosquito by seeing its structure. The Anopheles mosquito, if we see the structure, has got proboscis and palps which are the part of its mouth parts. Pro palps are the sensory organs which helps it in the sensory locomotions and the sensory findings while the proboscis is an integral part of the uh, mouth parts. So the mouth parts, uh, the proboscis and the palps in the Anopheles mosquito is long and almost of equal length. The second most distinguished feature in this Anopheles mosquito is the presence of the discrete blocks of black and white scales which are found scattered throughout the wings. And if we see the position or the resting position of this mosquito when the mosquito is resting on a surface, we can see that the abdomen is not placed parallel to these surfaces but it is angled at a particular 45 degree angle from the surface and the abdomen is hanging in the air. So these are the two major distinguished features through which we can easily find out that this is the Anopheles mosquito. And if we see the picture of the Anopheles mosquito, we can see that the Anopheles mosquito is loaded with the blood in its stomach and there are small white and black patches which are present in the wings. While the Aedes mosquito which causes the dengue and chikungunya which will be very prevalent during the monsoon seasons, the Aedes mosquito has got black and white patches 
which are uh, present throughout its body. So we can easily distinguish between Aedes and Anopheles because the Anopheles doesn't have the white and the black patches present throughout the body, legs, it's not present. But in the Aedes mosquito, if you can see in the legs, abdomen, all the areas, there is a black and white patch which is present. And the Aedes mosquito is the one which is responsible for the dengue and chikungunya. Now, if we go to the life cycle of plasmodium, the plasmodium life cycle is majorly divided into two hosts. The first host is the mosquito where the sexual part of the life cycle takes place and the second host is the human being where the asexual part of the life cycle takes place. So, these two hosts plays a very important role in the complete life cycle of the plasmodium or the malarial parasite. In the human host, the parasite uses two major machineries of the human system. The first one is the hepatic cell which are the part of the liver cell, liver and second one is the red blood cells which help in the transportation of the oxygen. So in the human host cell it uses the liver or the hepatic cell for its growth and development and subsequently it uses the red blood cells for its growth and development. And in the mosquito host cell it uses the mosquito gut or the stomach wall for the development. If we see the complete picture of the malarial parasite growth and development, we can see that as soon as the malarial parasite infects a healthy human being, it transfers the sporozoites or the parasites to these human beings. Through the blood, blood circulation, this parasite moves into the liver cells and in the liver cells, it starts growing and developing. In the liver cells, it divides to form a number of small cells which are called as merozoids and this stage is called as cyzone stage. After the cyzone stage is formed, the liver cell get busted out and all these cyzones or the merozoids get released to infect the red blood cells or the erythrocytes. So the fourth phase of the life cycle is called as the exoerythrocytic cycle while the next phase is called as the erythrocytic cycle. As soon as these merozoites are released, these goes and infect the fresh RBCs which are the red blood cells. So as soon as the red blood cells are infected, the parasites start growing within these red blood cells and the first stage which comes up is called as the ring stage and then comes the next stage which is called as the trophozoite stage which is the active feeding stage where the parasite uses the globin protein of the hemoglobin for its as its food source. Then the next stage comes is the cyzon stage where the parasite divides into a number of small cells and it gets it ruptures out from these cyzon stage cells to infect the fresh flow of the red blood cells. So this cycle goes on and on and this cycles in plasmodium falciparum, plasmodium oval and plasmodium vivax stays for about 48 hour while in the case of plasmodium malari it goes for about 72 hours. From these infected stages two of these cells grows and develops into gametocyte. One gametocyte is called as the male gametocyte while the other one is called as a female gametocyte. The paras then what happens is the uh, another mosquito comes and bites and sucks this blood of these human which is infected with this malarial parasite and these gametocytes now move into the blood, blood along with the blood into the uh, mosquito. In the mosquito, these develops into macro gametocyte and micro gametocyte which subsequently fuses to form the ookinate. This ookinate gets attached to the stomach wall of the mosquito and the second level of the development process start taking place which is called at the sporogonic cycle which takes place in the mosquito stomach. In the mosquito stomach this ookinate develops into oocyte which is by the division of this ookinate by a number of times and this oocyte subsequently develops into a sporozoites which are the small parasites which are the active form which goes and infects the healthy human beings. As soon as the sporozoites are formed, these sporozoites moves to the salivary gland of the mosquito and this mosquito is now ready to infect another healthy human being. It goes and inf bites a healthy human being and the parasites are infected 
are transferred to the human being and the malarial parasite exoerythrocytic and the erythrocytic cycle start taking place in the human being. Now, if we see the various symptoms which are occurring in the malaria, the first symptom the, is the fever condition which comes up. The fever are generally occur, are occurring because of the bursting out of the cyzone stage and the release of the merozoids. Actually, the merozoids are the uh, heme polymerized things which comes out from the heme and the hemoglobin. In the hemoglobin or the RBCs, the parasite uses the globin while the heme remains as it is. The heme is generally toxic to the parasite. So what the parasite intelligently does is it polymerizes the heme monomers and it forms a pigmented substance which is called as hemozoin. As soon as the cells burst out, the cyzoins are released, the hemozoins are released and at that particular point, the fever scales up. The next important feature of symptom of malaria is the fatigueness or the pain. Then there is spleen enlargement which is called as spleen megaloly. Then there is respiration problem. Then there is chilling, sweating, nausea, vomiting. Then there is a loss of appetite. Anemic conditions occurs because the parasite grows and develops within the red blood cells. So anemia is one of the major symptoms of malaria. Now, what exactly happens in this P. plasmodium falciparum, which is the most lethal form of the, all the parasites? The plasmodium falciparum is the most lethal form in which if the patient remains unattended for a number of days, the patient may die because of malaria. This is because the falciparum parasite has got a property called as sequestration or cytoadherence. So what happens is these parasites which are present within the red blood cells, which are shown in the picture as black spots within the red blood cells, these slowly goes within the uh, blood streams which are present in the brain tissues and goes and get cytoadhered to the basal surface of these blood vessels. Slowly and slowly, these blood vessels get blocked or choked by the parasitized erythrocytes. And subsequently, what happens that there is no flow of the blood through these blood vessels and the, that particular part of the brain gets disrupted from the supply of oxygen which was earlier given by the normal red blood cells and the brain dies because of the hypoxia condition or lack of oxygen. And this plasmodium falciparum parasites many a times are due to this property of sequestration and cytoadherence is referred as the cerebral malaria parasite. Now, when a patient goes to a doctor and the doctor senses that the patient might be suffering from the malaria, the first thing what he does is he go for a observation under the microscope or the blood stain or uh, blood film observation to detect the presence of the malarial parasite. So what the doctor does is he takes a small drop of the intravenous blood from the patient and prepares a slide which is shown in the picture how the slide is prepared. A blood smear is prepared and if you can see the middle picture over there we can see a thick smear and a thin smear. This smear is then stained with the help of the gymsa staining and this gymsa stain slide in which the parasites get stained because the gymsa stain is the stain which characteristically and specifically stain the DNA or DNA. So when, when the doctor observes these slide under the microscopes, he sees, he observes certain intraerythrocytic stages of plasmodium under the microscope. So if we can see the intraerythrocytic stages which are found in the red blood cells, are of three types. The first one is called as the ring stage. The second one is called as the trophozoid stage. And the third one is called as the cyzone stage. And if you can see the pictures on the right hand side corner and the left hand side corner are the stages which are shown seen under the microscope. So the first stage is the ring stage where we can see that there is a nucleus and a ring type structure which is present. Then there is a active feeding stage which is called as the trophozoid stage and subsequently there are small stages which are present within one small RBC that's called as the cyzon stage. So these are the particular stages which the doctors observes under the microscope and if the patient is having all these stages 
in his blood slide, then the doctor confirms that the patient is suffering from malarial parasite or the plasmodium falciparum. Subsequently, there are other methods or diagnostic te techniques which uses the ELISA and are called as rapid diagnostic tests through which he further confirms the presence of the malarial parasite. But this thin blood film is being recommended by the WHO as the gold standard for observing the malarial patients under the microscope. Now, uh, these malarial parasites can be cultured in the laboratory conditions. I have shown a picture over here in these, in the petri dishes which are seen on the left hand side corner. These uh, malarial parasites are being cultured and grown in these, uh, in these petri dishes which is, uh, which is added with the human blood and serum so that the normal inflow of the human blood and blood and serum can be given to the parasite which grows within this human blood cells and when when we want to do some experiment we take out some of the blood first check the parasitism which means that how many parasites are present within the rbcs and we prepare this slide just like the slide which we prepared for detection of the malarial parasites we prepare this slide stain this slide and observe under the microscope and if we can see the picture on the right hand side corner we can say see the malarial parasite parasite within the red blood cells in the top picture we can see the ring stages where we can see the red dot with the magenta red dot which is present and there is a purple color ring which is present and the picture below we can see the cyzoid and the trophozoite stages now the malarial parasite have been treated by various drug from ages the first and the well known drug which is is called as the quinine this quinine drug has been found as the one of the most be, uh, well known drug for the malarial treatment this remedy was discovered in the jungles of peru and ecuador where the trees were called as the tree of life the bark from these trees from the, the bark from these bark of the trees the quinine was extracted and it has been used by the local people from ages uh, to treat the skin diseases and the malarial conditions. The, disease, the, con the malarial conditions have been treated with this particular quinine way back, reported way back 1632. And if you can see an image of the tree picture which is called as a syncona and from the bark of this tree the quinine is extracted and this quinine has got a chemical structure which is shown in the image. There are various anti-malarials which are present in the market which are called as the quinine, chloroquine, mefloquine, which are, chloroquine, mefloquine are the synthetic forms of the quinine. Then there is antifolates which are present, sulfadoxin, pyramethmin. So there are a number of anti-malarials which are present. But the major disadvantage which these anti-malarials have developed is in the year 1980s, during the year 1980s, the malarial parasite have developed resistance against these well-known conventional anti-malarial drugs. This is because first, because of four reasons. The first one is the inadequate treatment, which means that when a doctor prescribes a patient a drug therapy for seven days, the patient takes the drug for three or four days, after which he stops taking the drugs because the symptom conditions goes away from his body. So it stops taking the drug, but that's the most lethal form because the parasite still exists within his body and it is circulating within his body. The second main reason for the development of drug resistance is the inappropriate self-treatment or mass administration, which means that we treat us uh, ourselves by our own means. We generally don't go to the doctor unless until we go to a very critical position. So that comes under the inappropriate self-treatment. The third reason is the drug half-life, which is very long. Due to this long drug half-life, the drug remains within the blood circulation for a longest period of time and the parasite gets the time to develop the resistance against this particular drug. And the fourth reason is the use of the conventional anti-malarials which are used as the monotherapies. <coughs> the next drug which came as a wonder drug for, to combat these uh, anti-malarial resistance classes was called as the artemisinin. This artemisinin has been used by the Chinese herbalists 
herbalist where about thousand of years ago for treatment of skin diseases and malaria the earliest record day back dates back to 200 bc where this artemisinin has been used for the treatment of the skin diseases and malaria the artemisinin is extracted from the leaves of the plant which is called as artemisia annua which is also called as sweet wormwood this artemisinin drug along with its derivative which are majorly called as the uh, dihydroartemisinin artemether artesunate are now used as the standard and most safest drug for treatment of malarial cases in the asia and african regions the who looking at the emergence of the drug resistance have now recommended in its publication that the drug should be given in a combination therapy rather than the monotherapy so it has said that the conventional anti malarial should be used in a combination therapy means two drugs or three drugs should be given in a combination therapy rather than giving only one drug because the parasite develops the resistance against the monotherapy very quickly now the indian from the indian perspective the malarial drug policy which is published in 2007 by the body in, uh, uh, which monitors the drug policy in india national vector borne disease control program it says that the first line of treatment in india should be with the help of the chloroquine if the patient doesn't get treated with the chloroquine the second line of the treatment should be with the help of the artemisinin combination therapy the artemisinin combination therapy is strongly recommended in the areas where the chloroquine resistance have been found especially in the areas of odisha west bengal where there is a high chloroquine resistance or the drug resistant parasites which are prevalent the artemisinin combination therapy includes the drug which is artesunate which is a derivative of artemisinin along with the sulfadoxin and pyrimethamin in when a patient goes to a doctor and the the doctor finds that the patient is suffering from malarial condition or the plasmodium falciparum which is the most lethal form of the plasmodium the first therapy which the doctor prescribes is the chloroquine along with a dose of primaquine primaquine is a drug which uh, inhibits or kills the liver stages of these malaria parasites so the chloroquine is given for 3 days and the primaquine is given for the first day so the combination therapy is also coming up into the indian policy and now most of the doctors or the rural health mission organizations throughout the india are giving the combination therapy rather than the conventional monotherapy now if we look the picture of the vaccines which are being developed globally throughout the world the recent uh, published data by who in 2014 says that there are 33 centers international centers who are developing the vaccines throughout the world till date there is no vaccines for malaria which is commercially available in the market so the vaccine development is one of the major hurdle for for treating this malaria because there is no vaccine the malarial cases are increasing day by day in india the icgb which is the international center for genetic engineering biotechnology in india it has also developed a vaccine which is in the phase trials which they have named as javac which is the blood stages vaccine the other promising vaccine which have been developed is the rts vaccine which is against the pre erythrocytic stages of the malaria which is in the phase 3 human trials of phase 3 human trials in mozambique zambia african countries and the recent results from these phase 3 trials of this rts vaccine have been very promising and it has shown a light that the vaccines may come up in the near future now let's take up the control and the prevention measures of these malaria where exactly do these malaria breed these malarial uh, mosquitoes generally breed in the stagnated water where there is a stagnant or a water which is present for a longer period of time like desert coolers uh, water storage pots unused tires then water reservoirs open water reservoirs uh, reservoirs rice paddies tire tracks irrigation water so wherever there is a open pit or open presence of the water these mosquito breeds over there 
Now let's see how these mosquito breeds in this water. If we see the picture over here, these are the mosquito breeding which is taking place in the stagnant water. And if, in the, if we see in the picture, we can see the larval and the pupal stages which are marked with a red arrow. These are the stages from which the malarial para, uh, mosquitoes or any of the mosquito like the Aedes or the Culex mosquito will come up from these larval forms or the pupil from these pupil forms. So these breeding conditions or the breeding places have to be stopped to stop the development or the breeding of these mosquitoes. Now the main strategy for this malarial control is the prevention of mosquito breeding. The major mosquito breeding prevention of mosquito breeding can be done with the help of source reduction which means that all the burrow pits, ditches, open well, open water reservoirs have to be filled up. The second major strategy which is being followed is the use of the chemicals like Fenthion, Thampos, Bt which is Bacillus thuringiensis, which kills and eliminates the larval form of the mo uh, mosquito vector. The other major strategy which is being followed throughout the India is the indoor residual spraying which we have seen through the uh, houses around us. So this indoor residual spray what they do is they spray the insecticide which are basically the DDT, HCH which is hexachlorocyclohexane, balathion and which are given at a dose which is recommended by government of India and these spray are being done within the houses where the mosquito can probably hide or start breeding. These places are generally the cracks or the dark places where the mosquito breeds. So the indoor residual spraying has a, become a major strategy for malarial control in India. Now the major strategies which are required for the protection from mosquito bites. The first major uh, control measure is the use of the mosquito repellents which are commercially available in the market. Like there are mosquito repellents, there are mosquito repellent creams. The second major protection that can be done is we should wear long pants and long sleeve uh, uh, trousers so that the mosquito doesn't have any open biting space, uh, open uh, biting area present on our body and the mosquito cannot bite us. The third major uh, strategy is the use of the window screens which can be used in the windows of the houses and these, uh, these doesn't allow the mosquito from the outside to get into the houses. The fourth major strategy which is being actively followed in the rural and and suburban areas is the use of the bed nets which we generally called as the machardani. So all these strategies has been one of the major strategies for the malarial control and from the protection from mosquito bites. Now the bed nets has been categorized into three major categories. The first one is the traditional bed nets which we uh, usually use throughout our normal days. These bed, traditional bed nets are made up of cotton or synthetic forms which may be polyester or synthetic forms. The other form is the in insecticide treated nets which are called as ITNs and the third one is called as the long lasting insecticidal nets. Let's take up each of these insecticide, each of these bed nets one by one. The first bed net is called as the insecticide treated nets. These insecticide treated nets are nothing but the normal or the traditional bed nets which can be converted into a insecticide treated nets by making it, uh, making it uh, treated with the insecticide which may be DDT, Malathion, HCH. So what happens, what, what is being done is the traditional bed nets are taken, then they are soaked into the insecticide solution and they are after a few hours they are taken out from these insecticide solution and then they are kept in the open condition for drying in the sunlight they dry up so that the fibers get the impregnation of this insecticide and then after proper drying these insecticide treated nets can be used for the normal uses. What happens is whenever a mosquito comes and tries to comes and reaches near this insecticide treated nets, they bite the fibers of these insecticide nets and the insecticide which is present in the fibers of these insecticide nets goes within the circulation or the 
body circulation of the mosquito and the mosquito dies over there itself. The National Vector Bond Disease Control Program in India have made the guidelines for the production of these insecticide treated nets which is available online. So those of you who are interested in uh, seeing how these insecticide treated nets can be made from the normal or the traditional bed net can see the link which is uh, shown over here which reads like navbdcp.gov.in slash doc slash guidelines for ITS dash LLINS dot PDF. So over here they have given the guidelines how these insecticide treated nets can be formed and made. The next major category of the bed nets are the long lasting insecticide nets. These long lasting insecticide nets are uh, pretty similar like the insecticidal nets but the only difference is they last for about 3 to 5 years because they are company manufactured. So what the company does is they prepare special synthetic fibers of the polyester in which the insecticide has been impregnated. So if we can see, see the pictures over here we can see the long lasting insecticidal nets which is being which is being given to the rural uh, population and these insecticidal nets can be used for about 3 to 5 years and they don't need any retreatment. What the advantage of these long lasting insecticidal nets have been found is they kill both the mosquito and they also repel the mosquito. The WHO has now given the recommendations for to a number of companies which are supplying this insecticidal bed nets of which the prominent one are the Olisate Permanet Interceptor. These long lasting insecticidal nets are now being actively distributed through the rel rural health mission centers throughout the India and through the ASHA representative or the medical representative through them you can collect and inquire about these long lasting insecticidal nets where exactly they can be found and the government of India is now freely distributing all these in insecticidal treated nets and the long lasting treated insecticidal nets through these rural uh, health missions. Uh, centers throughout the India. So they can be taken up from those centers and can be used during the night and the conditions for the sleeping and they are one of the very very effective medium for inhibiting the mosquito bites. So over here I finished the lecture where I have covered up the strategies which are being followed, the drugs and the various symptoms which are being found in this malaria. But at the end what I can say is the malarial parasite is developing very rapidly like the fifth strain of the malaria which was still now not known. The cases of the fifth strain of the malaria which is the plasmodium nolesi have been reported in the various uh, sub subcontinents like Thai Cambodia border even few of the cases have been reported in Andaman Nicobar. So this is the right time to develop a vaccine or the a potent anti-malarial drug which can abolish the malaria from the whole world. Thank you very much. Thank you sir. Thank you so very much for delivering such a nice lecture. Uh, but I have certain questions also because you have raised very important points that how um, hygiene or personal hygiene uh, hygiene of the surroundings is very important because it is the foremost thing which we keep on uh, discussing with I'd the like people, to... government keep on discussing and uh, making efforts, sincere efforts so that uh, the citizens of the country could have a healthy life. Now the question uh, is, uh, is it mandatory as I have heard uh, if we talk about malaria alone that uh, the mosquito uh, which uh, bites an uh, uh, infected person and then he takes uh, the disease to the healthy person that is if it bi uh, bites the healthy person the disease is transmitted. I mean, I want to know what is the cycle, what is this process basically? Actually, uh, we have already discussed the life cycle. What happens mm -hmm. is, suppose a person is suffering from malaria. What happens, the malaria, first phase of the life cycle goes into the human host, where the development takes place in the liver cells, then it moves to the red blood cells. Mm -hmm. In the red blood cells, what happens that the, from the red blood cells, the merozoites are released after the size on stages. These merozoites grow and few of the merozoites go and form 
the gametocytes, which are called as the male and female gametocytes. So this mal malarial patient, what happens is when a second mosquito comes and bites this malarial patient who is having these gametocytes circulating within its blood circulation, these malarial malarial mosquito, these mosquitoes takes up the blood from the circulation along with this blood these gametocytes are also taken up. So as soon as these gametocytes are taken up from the uh, blood of the individual who is infected with the malaria, the second phase of the life cycle start taking place within the vector which is the anophilus mosquito where the oocinate, oocyte and subsequently the sporozoites are formed. After the sporozoites are formed, these sporozoites within the vector are then transferred into the salivary glands of these malarial vectors. And this malarial vector is now ready for the second bite because these sporozoites are the stages which are the active malarial stages. And as soon as this malarial vector goes and bites the healthy individual, it transfers or transmits these sporozoites into the individual and these sporozoites through the blood circulation in the human beings goes to the liver cells and again the life cycle of the liver cells then the erythrocytes start taking place. So these malarial vectors are playing a very major role in the transferring of these malarial parasites from one healthy individuals from uh, the malarial infected individual to a healthy individual and then from the healthy individual who is now infected with the malarial parasite to another healthy individual. So it is very essential to block these particular developmental stages at very level. That's why I said that most of the drug resistance have developed because we due to the inappropriate self-treatment. What happens is most of the us whenever we are suffering from most of the symptoms which are the normal symptoms for the malaria, we neglect those symptoms. And in the neglect process what happens is the malaria parasites start growing within the body circulation and the parasitemia or the number of parasites within the RBCs decrease, increase down. And as the number of malaria inf infected para parasites increase down, the body suffers from anemic condition. In this anemia condition what happens is because the parasite grows and takes up its food source from the hemoglobin which is the red blood cells, what happens is the person, the red blood cells lies out. So most of the red blood cells start lies, lysing out because the parasite are growing within them. And if you see the life cycle of the parasite from a single red blood cell where the merozoite is growing, there are about 16 to 13, 32 merozoites which are released from that particular red blood cell. So from one red blood cell, rupturing of one red blood cell which is parasitized by the merozoites, 16 to 32 merozoites are released which can go and infect the fresh, fresh flow of the red blood cell. So you can imagine at after each cycle how the parasitemia or the level of the parasites are growing drastically within the human, the infected patient circulation. Uh, sir, now the question arises, is it mandatory that uh, uh, the disease is going to be uh, transmitted or uh, transferred? Because sometimes I don't know whether it is right or wrong that we talk about if a person has a good immunity, uh, it doesn't hamper. Does it, uh, is uh, the case with the malaria also? Yeah, many a times what happens is uh, like whenever the patient, uh, the healthy person is transmitted with the malarial parasite, the patient may develop a immune systems against this parasite. But what happens is these parasites are so intelligent, they have developed the immune, they compromise the immune surveillance systems which is present within our body. So they evade out these immune surveillance system and start developing. Like for example, the cerebral malaria case, which is, which is occurring due to the plasmodium falciparum parasite, which goes and attaches to the blood vessels present within the brain's, brain tissues. So what happens is these particular uh, erythrocytes or the red blood cells which are parasitized uh, by the malarial parasites are so intelligent that what they do is 
they get evaded out from the immune system because if they get blocked in the immune systems they will be choked out or the uh, blocked out from the human body circulation so the, what they do is they change the surface protein structure and those things and subsequently they evade out these immune surveillance system and they reach the brain tissue cells over their brain tissue cells slowly and slowly over a period of time they block the blood vessels and the person suffers from the brain stroke because there is no active supply of the oxygen because the blood vessels in the brain has been blocked <coughs> due to the choking of these parasites and the person dies of the because of the cerebral malaria or a high level of plasmodium falciparum in some way or the another we can say that they are going to hamper you or they are going to attack you in some yeah. way or the another and causing uh, one or the another deformity. Uh, now the question arises, um, uh, do we have to take care of the hygiene of the person who is already infected? Because we already always talk about the hygiene and uh, hygiene of every person or the healthy person, but yeah. we never talk about the hygiene of the person who is already infected. Yeah. In order to um, uh, save other people from yeah. uh, transmitting the diseases, yeah. it is better to save the yeah. person. Yeah, because uh, it has been said that the person who is suffering from malaria has to be protected and kept in a proper environment like he or she has to be kept in a room which is having mosquito repellents present he or she should be pre kept in a uh, environment which is uh, uh, covered up with the bed nets and these things because the person who is suffering from the malaria has got a very low immune system so there are chances that if there is a second level of infection or the bite from the mosquito, a second infection of malaria can start taking place. There has been cases in which a person suffering suffers simultaneously from different species of malarial parasites. So the patient has to be kept and proper rest has to be taken because the patient is suffering from hemolytic anemia condition, he is suffering from vomiting, nausea condition, there is a weight loss which is occurring. Then if the patient is suffering from the plasmodium falciparum and the drugs are going, then the proper food and the proper health condition should be monitored so that the patient is under proper guidance because the falciparum, if the falciparum parasites are not treated within th three to four days, the patient might go into a coma condition because of the cerebral condition. So the patient has to be treated very carefully. There should be regular checkup of the patient means through the blood samples and through this parasitemia like making the blood films and the, every day they should be checked like how much parasitemia has increased in the blood circulation and whether the parasitemia has decreased after taking the drug doses if the drugs are not affecting like for example most of the regions which are present in the Orissa are the chloroquine resistance resistant parasite areas so the drugs which are given are not the drugs which are uh, like similar to the chloroquine like quinine or mefloquine. The drugs which are given are the artemisinin based combination therapy. So it has to be checked whether the parasite which is circulating within the body of that particular patient, whether that parasite is a chloroquine resistant or a chloroquine sensitive strain so that the correct measure and the correct drug can be given to that particular patient and the patient takes up that drug for the complete radical treatment or for the complete dosage seven days or the six days through the drugs is taken. So the patient has to be monitored regularly and continuously so that the patient doesn't suffer from any of the adverse conditions or a second insect bite. Now it was the matter of uh, how to uh, save the person uh, already, already infected but sometimes it is seen that sometimes in rural areas basically the patients are diagnosed with the malaria but actually they don't, uh, they, think that, they think that they are having the symptom of uh, ma malaria but yeah. actually they are not suffering from, from malaria the and uh, the medicines like such as Cunan is given to the persons uh, who have no such disease. In that condition uh, how harmful is Cunan to the person who is not affect in, uh, affected with this disease? Yeah. What happens is many of the conditions it have been found that 
even the person is suffering from malaria but he or she is not showing the symptoms because the person has developed the immune system or immunotolerance for that particular parasite so the parasite when it develops to a particular level of parasitemia then only the per person develops the malarial conditions but many of the cases what happens like the person thinks that he is having the malaria conditions but he is suffering from some other fever conditions like the condition most of the conditions for the chikungunya and the dengue where the fever occurs is similar like the conditions which are found in the malarial stages so the first and the essential part is to check whether the person is suffering from malaria or not and for that in most of the uh, rural and the urban areas there are medical centers and there are asha representatives who are the representative of the health health practitioners who knows how to they take up the samples and they know how to do the rapid diagnostic use the rapid diagnostic test tools and from these rapid diagnostic test tools they can easily say that the patient is suffering from malaria or some other diseases if the patient is suffering from malaria the asha representatives give him or her the proper appropriate drugs for the treatment of the um, pa parasite if the patient is not suffering from the malaria because if we take the blood sample intravenous blood sample prepared the blood slide which is the gold standard which is recommended by who for checking whether the person is suffering from malaria or not we can easily see that the blood sample if the blood sample doesn't have any parasites we can easily say that the person is not suffering from the malaria it may be because of some other disease condition which may be having a similar kind of symptoms and if the patient is having the parasites which are present within the red blood cells in this slide we can easily say that the person is suffering from malaria and we can start giving the first level of the drugs which is the chloroquine drug therapy now this was the matter of uh, how to protect a person or how to uh, make the people aware that uh, they should get themselves tested first uh, what uh, is your say because uh, as we are on the verge of ending this topic uh, so what is your say uh, uh, as a responsible citizen of india what uh, we could uh, deliver people that uh, how they should protect themselves as well as their uh, people uh, from this particular disease yeah the uh, what i think means personally is the uh, people should protect themselves the few the measures which i said that they should keep a proper and clean environment around themselves they if there is any kind of open pit open water reservoir anything which is open they should close it with the help of the lids or with the help of the other measures so that the breeding grounds of the mosquitoes stops over at that particular very level because the this is the mosquito anopheles is the mosquito which causes the malaria this is this uh, these mosquito uh, there are other mosquitoes also like uh, culex aedes mosquito which cause the chikungunya and dengue they also requires a stagnant water or a fresh water where the mosquito breeding takes place so the closing of all these source reduction is a very important criteria of stopping this malarial condition the second major thing is prop keeping a proper check like we can put the proper uh, window mesh around uh, our houses so that the window shields or the screens can be uh, uh, put in the windows then we can use the bed nets mosquito repellents can be there the third important thing is whenever a patient suffers from the malaria or he or she has been diagnosed with the malaria uh, the patient should uh, uh, religiously take all the drugs which is being recommended or given to the patient he or she should not do like this like he or she is given a drug for 7 days after 3 days the symptoms goes off from his body and the patient start stop taking the drugs so that's the most lethal part of development or the emergence of the resistance strain so because the parasite is still not ended in the blood circulation it's still there so the major thing is that we should keep a proper clean environment the patients who are suffering from malaria should go for a proper and continuous check and all the preventive measures which is been recommended by government of india and national vector borne diseases control programs through their website should be followed in all the rural as well as the urban areas 
with this note uh, that is beautiful note of uh, yours that uh, how everybody should uh, make their environment clean and have a healthy and successful life uh, i wish you all the best and thank you so very much for thank delivering you. such a nice lecture thank you sir thank you thank very you. much